Since we got the second season of The Last of Us, fans have been waiting for the spores. The spores were a huge part of the game lore, and fans were itching to see them finally on screen. Luckily for us, the season 2 episode 5 finally dives deep into those floaty, invisible death seeds that we didn't get to see until now. These spores are finally airborne, and they are, well, way more terrifying than we initially thought. In this episode, we'll dive deep into the science behind these spores, how they function, what are the implications for our beloved character now with these spores in the mix, and a lot more. So if you're interested, keep watching. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What is the secret of level B2? The real life Cordyceps fungus is extremely terrifying. It can affect all kinds of arthropods, hijack their body before erupting them like a disgusting fireworks display. But The Last of Us showed us what would have happened if these fungi could affect human life forms. Everyone knew that the airborne spores were deadly, and all fans were waiting for the past two seasons, wondering when we'd get to see them. These airborne killers were a staple in the first season of the show. Whenever we saw Ellie and Joel put on their masks, we knew things were about to get real. However, in the TV adaptation, we don't get to see them in the first season. There were no spores, no gas masks, and of course, no explanation was given. Fans assumed that this was done out of a creative decision, and to ground the science for the show. But now we're back in business. We finally get into the belly of the beast, level B2, and learn how exactly the show is going to go down that airborne horror path. So now, the first question that I've been dying to ask is, what is the level B2? Well, to put it simply, there's a secret quarantine and research level that belongs to a facility way before the outbreak ever happened. This place was sealed off and left completely undisturbed for years. They could have introduced it before. Well, silly, this level B2 is the smoothest way they could have introduced us to spores. Since level B2 has never been explored or explained before, it was something new to all of us. It's a time capsule in a way. In an interview, the showrunners have explained that the lack of spores in the first season was actually deliberate. In the first season, they wanted to focus on the visible horror of fungus sprouting out of someone's mouth and the tendrils. But but now, in the second season, they felt that the narrative was ready to expand. The mutation is expanding and mutating with nothing to keep a check on it, so the airborne spores of the fungus seem like an unavoidable escalation. Hence, the level B2 is where the rules as we know them change for good, and even breathing becomes deadly. Level B2 is a dark and damp place. Biologically speaking, this is the perfect place to grow fungus. So this is the perfect spore factory. This mirrors the real world fungal biology. In the real world, spores require high humidity and protection from sunlight to germinate. The temperature has to be consistent throughout. Usually, basements, tunnels, and old military bunkers act as the best places for them. So by introducing level B2 with the spores, science is grounded in reality. But there's another thematic layer to this discovery. Level B2 represents something greater. It's a place with buried secrets, the place that humanity ignored in its own hubris. This is also the metaphor for the hidden depths of the infection. And once level B2 is open, not only will the airborne threat, but also the knowledge, fear, and grim realization of their future become evident. So what I'm trying to say is that the late introduction of the spores was not an L on the showrunner's part. This was a strategic move, done quite intentionally to give us a horrifying reveal. B2 is more like a ticking time bomb buried underground, ready to blow up in our faces at any time. It's a turning point for the infections we've seen so far, and let's be real, we're simply scratching the surface. Why do these spores thrive in dark, moldy environments? The best way to describe fungi would be quiet opportunists. You see, they love darkness. Decay is something that they thrive on. And in The Last of Us, the cordyceps we see on screen, they behave with terrifying accuracy in general fungal biology. The spores we see in the second season are not just threats that are simply floating around, there's more to it. These spores are a natural response to the environment in which the cordyceps were given. Now the question is, why does this mold in particular prefer the dark? Well, to understand we need to start back from the basics. As I mentioned a while ago, there are three components that any kind of fungi, like mushrooms, mold, or cordyceps genus, require to thrive. They need moisture, stable temperature, and a complete lack of UV light. You see, the sunlight is absolutely dangerous to spores. The sunlight manages to disrupt the cellular integrity of the spores, and even dries out the hyphal growth. This leads to them killing the airborne conidia even before they germinate. That's why we see this kind of fungal bloom only in the shaded parts of the forest, or at 
at least the favorite part of your fridge. Even though The Last of Us is a fictional universe, the science in it is very real, as the camera descends to places like Level B2 or the subway tunnels, we're basically looking at ecosystems that were built for the fungal domination. They have stagnant airflow, constant humidity, and of course, no sun, so the spores can form dense clouds in this region and even hang in the air for hours, waiting for the right organic surface to latch onto, even if it's a human lung. The mold-infested stations we see in the second season are not only a good horror set in this spore-infested nightmare, but they also are completely rooted in biology. The spores can only appear in areas where the infection was allowed to grow and incubate for large periods of time without any disturbances. The best way I can paint an image for you guys is this whole setting we're seeing. This is an underground fungal forest. The walls are lined with mycelium, and the corpses of the unlucky who have ventured down here. They have become a spore fruiting tree. In short, these zones are completely alive. In the real world, studies regarding fungal blooms in this kind of enclosed room have shown around a million spores per cubic meter. In these kinds of conditions, it's extremely hard to breathe, and in some people, breathing a few viable spores causes them serious respiratory illness. So while it makes total sense why in the first season, it didn't make sense for the showrunners to introduce the spores. The first season mostly took place above ground. There were wind currents, air dilutions, and of course UV rays. So even if there were spores, the spore level would be too low for an infection that would truly horrify us. But down in the basement like that, it's a whole different story. This is where spores flourish. Hence, whenever we see a character cough in those places, we know this is not just a sign of them getting contaminated, it's their death sentence. The environment as a whole is a weapon that's ready to kill them silently, and there's nothing they can do about it. So it makes sense why we usually see these regions completely sealed off or burnt in the ground. In short, we can say that the spores that we're seeing now, they're not supernatural. They're entirely logical and very much possible. Are airborne spores more infectious than a direct fungal bite? Up until now, the worst thing that anyone could think of in the Last of Us universe was getting bitten by a clicker. Well, as luck would have it, that's not the worst case scenario anymore. I mean, it's bad, don't get me wrong, but with how the fungal lore is evolving in the show, the airborne spores are much more dangerous. Why, you ask? Well, these spores will bypass your skin altogether and go into the lungs where they'll germinate. Then, after officially breaking down your immune system, the infection would spread to your brain through your bloodstream. Let me break it down for you. So in season 1, the infection spread because of contact. Either you got bit, or you got scratched, or you got one of those ugly tendrils. Now, this method mostly depends upon breaking the skin. Once the skin barrier is broken, the fungal material is forced into your body so that it can take root there. It's dangerous, but it's a lot of work. When it comes to the spore, this ignores all of that. All you have to do to get zombified is simply breathe. The real world science actually backs up this threat. The fungal spores, especially from molds like Aspergillus sp and Histoplasma sp, are usually transmitted via breathing. Once they enter the respiratory act, they start germinating and invading the tissues. This causes a systemic infection inside the body without leaving any mark on the skin. The lungs act fast as the funeral day spa, and infection spreads all over the body through them. The spores we see in the show work similarly. Every breath taken in the unventilated area with a high spore count is a gamble. No visible wound is needed for the infection to happen. With just a few breaths, you're incubating a death sentence. That's why characters are often terrified to find spores around you. It's already too late. And as if that were not the worst part, the spores are usually extremely persistent. In the real world, depending on the species, fungal spores may remain viable for days, if not weeks. They can cling to anything, from the dust to furniture and even clones. If someone walks through a spore-dense region, they have to properly decontaminate themselves, otherwise they risk bringing the deadly spores with them into the safe zones. This, as you can guess, adds a new layer of fear to the airborne spores. Not only can the spores simply infect you, even if you're not infected, but they'll surely infect your loved ones if you're not careful about it. The showrunners explained in interviews that they reinforce the spores like this to increase the threats that the characters are facing. Until now, it was all about the monsters being the danger. Now even the environment and the atmosphere are dangerous. You don't need to be attacked to get infected anymore. You simply need to breathe and be in the wrong place. This will definitely hype up the paranoia amongst characters, giving us an even more tense situation. Oh, <laughs> 
How do I infect bodies and become fused to walls? Are those hosts still alive? If you saw the corpses fused to the wall and found yourself horrified, be assured you're not the only one. The infected bodies that appear to have fused into the surfaces with the fungal ivy mycelium are one of the show's grotesque visuals. But there's more to this than just being terrifying. This is also called root mycology as a whole. And let me tell you, the answer is far more creepy than you would have imagined. However, their bodies are being used as structural anchors and nutrient hubs for the fungus acting as the best possible reason for spores to cluster in those regions. Let me paint you a picture. This is a particular type of fungus known as Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. This fungus affects insects. After infecting them, the fungi manage to hijack the motor functions of these insects and guide them to the highest place possible. Once there, the fungi kill off the host and then spread the spores as far as they can using the wind. This is an efficient and horrifying system, but it's very real, and The Last of Us extrapolates upon this method. When the host can no longer walk around because they're injured or dying, the fungus goes into survival mode. Instead of trying to move the host, it transforms the dying corpse into a fruiting body. The fungal root structure grows into the muscle tissue and organs and eventually bursts outward. Then they glue onto a nearby surface, turning into what could be called a spore cannon. And yes, this aspect of the cordyceps behavior is also based on reality. Mycologists have seen the wood decay fungi behave this way in dead trees. These fungi interact with the hosts and decompose it. Then it uses the carcass of the dead host to aid in reproduction. If you ever replace the tree with human, you get The Last of Us. While the visual imagery and the realistic science behind these scenes are certainly horrifying, another reason why I feel these scenes look so horrifying has to be how it blurs the line between death and life. The hosts are dead, but there's the fungi inside of them, completely alive. This is grotesque, yet it feels beautiful. There seems to be something almost ancient and ritualistic about it. Also, another thing to notice is that the bodies are not randomly picked. Each of them is strategically placed placed, such as near the entry or near the airflow. It's almost like they're optimized for the spore disposal, and all of those unlucky people ended up becoming the hosts. For them, the cordyceps was their tombstone, but also something that weaponized them without their consent. It's almost nature's way of saying that it was simply not done with humanity, yet, even in death. Can spores create new infected individuals without any host-to-host -host contact? The short answer to that question is yes. The long answer is hell yes. This is why introducing the spores in the second season ups the ante so high. Unlike the other infections we've seen up till now, there's no need for any host-to-host -host interaction anymore. You breathe in a wrong place at the wrong time, you're dead. Your partner walked into a spore-rich area and forgot to decontaminate themselves just right, you're dead. And the spore-based reproduction is wholly based on sound biology. The areas of high contamination as we see in the show are the places where the cordyceps variants thrive. Once inhaled, they make their way to your soft, oxygen-rich, and moist lung tissues and spread from there. Every vital organ gets conquered one by one through the bloodstream and then it makes its way to the brain, rewriting the motor function completely. The cordyceps infection also triggers aggression, first before hijacking complete control. Instead of previously infected hosts being presented, this kind of infection can spread from the old corpse of an infected individual especially the kind that have been turned into a spore cannon like I described before. Entering these stones without the proper gear is completely stupid. The environments are effectively self-sustaining bioweapon zones. The spores are invisible, odorless, and downright escape. And since they remain unsustained for long times, they also risk the chances of passive spreading of the infection, which is absolutely something we do not want. From the world-building perspective, this kind of threat is absolutely mind-blowing. We're beaten over the head with the fact that nature is extremely dominant, and now humanity Humanity is nothing in front of it. The infected ones in the environment, both are dangerous for the surviving humans. Are these spores more like human or parasitic molds? Anyway, the spores we see here are both. The Last of Us fungal organism is a chimera. It blends with mushroom-producing fungi and parasitic molds together to give us a very plausible and possible pathogen that we should all be afraid of. The mushroom-like elements of the cordyceps fungi are the large fleshy fruit we see coming out from the heads, mouths, and eye sockets of the infected. They're very much like real-world mushrooms in the sense that they act as reproductive organs. They're designed to produce and spread spores. Their shape and rapid growth are very similar to the real-life fungi known as Cordyceps militaris. This fungus infected insects, and we can see club-shaped protrusions from their corpses. On the other hand, we have the parasitic mold part of the Cordyceps brain infection. This is the real engine of the infection. The fungal molds like Aspergillus or Rhizopus spread through the mycelial network. The hyphae, as in the microscopic threads, create the network and invade the tissue only to get digested in and out. In The Last of Us, we see this particular side of the Cordyceps in the way it 
takes over the human anatomy completely. It grows through the bloodstream and hijacks the entire body in no time. Mushrooms are symbiotic in nature. They either provide something to the host in return or grow on dead matter, breaking down the dead host for nutrients. But the molds are not like that. They're completely aggressive and extremely parasitic in nature. The show's cordyceps acts like the ophiocordyceps I mentioned a while back. The visual language of this show leans toward the fungal body horror, with the science backing it up. The mushrooms we see in the show are very visually distinctive, and there's no way you'll ever forget them. And pair that up with the mold-like properties, and we have a terrifying pathogen on our hands. The cordyceps fungus takes the best or worst traits, depending on how you look at it, from both OG, these phyla, giving the reproductive effectiveness of the mushroom paired with the ruthlessness of the molds. And the spores? They're simply the worst evolutionary present you could ask for. Who or what chooses which infested becomes wall fused? I'm sure that after I pointed it out, everyone was brought up to speed regarding the placement of the infected corpses. They seem to watch over the doorways or be near the entryways like the sentinels. And with how distinct the placements are, you have to wonder if someone is deliberately placing them like that. The truth is, no one's doing that, it's simply evolution taking every opportunity it can get. See, fungi can't think, they don't plan, they don't have meetings, they're simply extremely well adapted, and that's what we see in The Last of Us. As much as we would love to say that the fungus intentionally placed the corpses in those places, they're purely coincidental. If the infected is critically wounded or immobilized, the fungus recycles the host body as a reproductive launching pad, and in order to do so, it does so by setting the corpse in the most viable place. The show does tease the whole hive mind narrative that some fans have theorized on Reddit, and with the whole touch a tendril and something else wakes up miles away in the shadow, we can see that there's some sort of connection or intelligence present. While the showrunners have not confirmed anything, Thing, the intelligence in the fungi is evident, and that was what was horrifying about fungi. They're simply doing what they're meant to do, survive, spread, and use every resource it has to their advantage. Marvelous Verdict. The Last of Us is classified as a horror show and game, and while we love focusing on the zombies we see in it, it's never been about that. Instead, The Last of Us has always been about the way the world was claimed by entire biology, and the horrifying results of that. By introducing the spores in this season, the show deepens the lore and horror, giving us more things to fear. The cordyceps analog in the show is something truly brilliant. It's grounded and real fungal behavior and is stretched enough to be simply believable. The infection we see here is the representation of a force power that's greater than us. It doesn't care about anything other than its own nature. It simply wants to spread, and all it takes to fall victim to it is the one breath. Let us know what you guys think about this episode, The Last of Us, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye! If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.